What is feminism? Um, I think the m the most common definition is the social, political, and economic equality between the sexes. So according to that definition, I would definitely identify as a feminist. Okay. Yeah, in general, I agree with that definition. I believe that we should not be discriminated unfairly on the basis of sex, if I had to add any addition to feminism. I would agree with all that, and then I would also add on just kind of adding more cultural currency to just female spaces, women's interests, and just women's proclivities in general. Hmm. That last good if that's what it were, but I, don't, I actually think feminism does the opposite of that in practice, and frankly going all the way back to the beginning of feminism in the 18th century, probably my definition of feminism would be Gloria Steinem's definition, she was the very famous feminist of the second wave, mm -hmm. uh, which is that a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Feminism is the idea that men and women are not complementary, they're not different and helpful to one another, but they're identical and indiscernible. That they're, you know, there are some superficial differences. You ladies might be a little prettier perhaps than I am, but all in all, we're basically exactly the same. And I, I don't think that's true. I think it's a false view of human nature, and I think it's harmful to everybody and especially harmful to women. Right. I've worked with Gloria Steinem's company, Women's Media Center, for like four years back My in condolences. <laughs> and Obviously, that's like a more crass interpretation of, I think, what she meant by that, which I think is more so, she's more so um, characterizing the fact that women in general, when they're taught how to self-actualize, it's typically tied to contingency on a man and getting married and starting a family versus men when they're told um, the ways to self-actualize, it doesn't necessarily require a woman. So obviously her saying a woman needs a man the way a fish needs a bicycle sounds crass and like she's being a bit, bit misandrous and obviously some radical interpretations may take it that way. But I think what she's trying to say is that women, you can like define yourself and your career and your potential outside of simply marriage and children. What do you mean by the phrase self-actualize? Um, just like live up to your potential, you know, use your mm -hmm. rational faculties, you know, use the design of your potential in your brain. Uh, I agree that I want to live up to my highest potential. I want women to live up to their highest potential. I want total human flourishing. But I think you've given away the game on the radical and liberal foundation of feminism, which is the notion that it comes purely from the self. It's a matter of self-liberation that, that I can do totally self-sufficiently as if I were an island unto myself. But no man is an island unto himself. And mm. so I didn't make myself. I uh, didn't create the family that I was born into. I didn't create the community that I was born into, the country that I was born into. I, I take the opposite view of the liberal view. The liberals say that man is fundamentally an individual. The conservatives would say, no, man is a social creature. You know, man is a political animal. And so the irony, I think, of someone like a Gloria Steinem saying that we, we, or insinuating that we just want women to live up to their fullest potential, is that the, the way that she and the feminists have done it is to totally erase women. Mm -hmm. And I think this goes back way further than the second wave. You sometimes hear conservatives, the squishy kind, they say, we love the feminism, but only the, you know, the second wave, not the third wave, or we like the first wave, not the second, or whatever, we're on like the 10th wave now. But it's been a problem from the beginning. Even Mary Wollstonecraft, who, who founds feminism with the vindication of the rights of woman, uh, she writes that uh, providence has created men in such a way that they are... Um, more inclined to virtue and they're more endowed with virtue. And I think that's exactly what Gloria Steinem thinks because the, the way that second wave feminism actually was practiced was it denied the virtues particular to women and it said the only way to be virtuous and to flourish is to be a man. So if women want to be virtuous and flourish, they got to dress like men and they got to have the same attitudes towards sex as men and they got to work in the workplace exactly as men do and they just have to pretend to be men. Mm -hmm. But I think that's very uh, disrespectful to women and harmful to them because if a woman tries to be a man, she's always going to fail. Just look at the Penn swim team now when... <laughs> And, and defeat them. This is why some feminists wisely are turning against the I think women are great. Women have a wonderful nature, and when women are fully women, they can really flourish. And when they pretend to be men, they get miserable. I think um, what a lot of feminists would push back on or worry about is this idea that we have ascribed gender to certain things that are kind of agendered. So, for example, when it comes to the workplace, um, the idea that like, oh no, a woman must stay at home, going out and working is a man's job, seems to be something that a lot of people have contention with. Because it seems like, I'm not saying that women don't have a place at home, taking care of children, but it doesn't seem like it should necessarily be limited to just that. So for example, um, even like throughout history, you still have women who 
despite taking care of home, also have like side jobs or side hustles or stuff like that to help contribute to the family. So I think this whole idea that's like, oh no, like women are just trying to be men. Sometimes I wonder, oh no, we are just saying that this is for a man to do, even though it seems like there's more opportunity for women to participate in those arenas as well. I think you've just made my point though, which is that you say throughout history, including long before feminism ever came onto the scene, women did plenty of things, you know, in addition to just being barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, right? They had, uh, they were involved in their community. They had side hustles, as you put <laughs> it. Um, so, so they did all these things. I mean, I think of the most famous anti-feminist American of the 20th century. It was Phyllis Schlafly. Phyllis Schlafly had six kids. She was a housewife. She uh, said the only person whose permission she needs for her political activism is her husband's, which irritated feminists to no end. She's one of the most important political figures of the whole century. She single-handedly killed the Equal Rights Amendment, traveled all over the country, one of the most vaunted figures in the American right. Uh, she, She was able to do a lot of things in public, but she recognized that her particular role that her husband never could have, that no man on earth ever could have, even if he kids himself, is to have children, to be a woman, to be graceful, to uh, to do the things that men can't do, and so she can do she can do things beyond that as well. But uh, if if you erase the particular advantages of women, the women are are put at a disadvantage. I mean, the problem is women were also excluded from doing a lot of things. So I don't think anyone here thinks there are no differences between men and women. But there's a lot of overlap as well. And while men and dif- women may be different on something on average, to look at a woman like I think you're, you and some of your other conservatives are under fire for saying, oh, if it's a female pilot, I'm automatically going to assume that this person is incompetent. I've never said that. Though, if, if an airline tells me that they are prioritizing DEI over uh, merit in the cockpit, I would probably book another airline. Okay, that's and that's, I but guess I, that's a know, little different. I get what I'm you're saying. I get that. But my but, point you know. is like to say women are just emotional, more emotional than men. That may be true on average, but to then look at a woman and just be like, automatically I'm going to assume this woman is more emotional, I think that isn't... That's the last so why is it true on average, though? It may be true on average because we're different. I've never said we're not different, right. but the problem is to say we're different and then put us into categories and be like, there can be no out overlap. Women have to do this role and men have to do this role. That's, I think, what feminism so then, is pushing back on. What you're arguing for is a kind of feminism that says actually uh, all the differences between men and women it's totally true in the aggregate there, you know in these two different types but on rare occasion there's going to be some it's woman not that who comes rare like let's say like okay gender roles like let's say most people like let's say 70 to 80 percent of people will fall into natural gender roles but then there's still 20 percent of our population that may not mm-hmm. and do we make a society where we force that 20 percent into these roles or do we allow choice i think a lot of feminism the cornerstone feminism is choice for women you can't I'm stay not home so sure about that i'm not so sure because there was a famous debate between betty friedan who was the prominent american feminist and simone de beauvoir one of the most famous feminists of the 20th century. It was in 1975, and Betty Friedan said what you said. She said, look, I think we should give women a choice. To, maybe they want to go out into the workplace, or maybe they want to stay home and raise their kids, but they should have a choice. And Simone de Beauvoir, who was a more consistent and intelligent feminist, said there can't be a choice. And the reason there can't be a choice is that if given the choice, most women would stay at home. And if most women stay at home, women will not be free. If we want true women's liberation, women must be forced to be free. And Friedan recoiled from this because she knew it wasn't going to play well in Peoria. But Simone de Beauvoir had, had the right point, and I think the, the more consistent feminists have agreed with her. I don't know. I mean, feminism has, like, it's gone so many different directions, so to pick the feminists that we don't agree with for this debate, I don't know if that's yeah. conducive to... Also, I'm not necessarily sure when you're saying like, oh no, um, most women would stay at home. That's a choice that they would have. Because when you look at like the uprisings of like feminism or when it gained the most traction, it was post-war era, um, partly because of the reason why is because during these war eras, men went out, they were drafted, they had to go fight, et cetera, et cetera. Women were expected to take up more um, traditional male spaces, work, and when the men came back, yeah. Uh, what ended up happening is that a lot of women did not want to leave the jobs that they had. They wanted to keep um, the somewhat level of financial independence that they were able to gain. And that's why we see like these huge like feminist uprisings during those periods of time. So it seems to me if you're saying that most women would stay home, um, that just wouldn't happen. Like women would have not had like these feminist movements go forward. Well, the, the feminists didn't want to leave their jobs, but women broadly perhaps did. So anecdotally, people write in a lot and they tell me, Michael, you know, I'd 
at least while my kids are little, I'd love to stay home and raise them. Maybe I'll go back to work after, but I just can't. It's, you can't raise a family in America for the average person today on one income. And that's a result of women entering the workforce and wages decrease, which is why not only the radical left, but also the more um, commercially minded right wing was in favor of that. It's the same reason they're in favor of mass migration. It just lowers wages for people. Uh, a lot of women, however, seem to feel not that they have the choice to, to go to work, but that they have to. And this is expressed in a famous study that came out of UPenn and was published by Yale in 2008, which was the paradox of declining female happiness. And I love the way this study opens up. Right in the abstract it says, despite the past 35 years, I'm paraphrasing, but despite the past 35 years showing so much marked progress and improvement in the lives of women, women's happiness, according to this meta-analysis, has declined both absolutely and relative to men. So it's not even just that everyone got more miserable because of, I don't know, a bad economy or something. Women in particular became less happy despite all these objective improvements to their lives. So to me, the, the obvious rejoinder to that is, well, maybe those objective improvements, namely feminism, that's the thing that happened between 1973 and 2008, uh, maybe that wasn't an objective good. Maybe that was just well, illusory. Well, to me, the obvious would... rejoinder of that is that women are becoming disillusioned with the life they had prior. They're like leaving the cave, so to speak, allegorically. And also, I don't think you should use self-reported happiness as a metric of justice or any like objective good, because you can plot self-reported happiness with pretty much any variable. Like highest reported crime, violent crime in the United States also is directly correlated to self-reported happiness. Does that mean one causes the other? No. Does that mean we should think what, what about violent crime What do you mean by that? Highest violent crime is correlated. I'm just saying in the periods of time when we've had the most violent crime in the United States, States, there's also a correlation between highest rates of self-reported happiness. Well, not, not according to the survey I just cited, right? Well, if, if happiness has been declining steadily, especially for women since 1973 to 2008, you had a major crime spike in the early 90s, but you didn't have a major spike in happiness. So perhaps there's some survey that you're referring to in some city mm -hmm. somewhere, well, but, just, just but it wouldn't... To, wouldn't uh, but also even women this. living traditional lifestyles are seeing a downfall in happiness. So why is it that the women who are still living the type of lifestyle that you would probably prescribe to women are also having a decrease in happiness? Also, I'm, not, I'm the, not convinced of that. Institute of Family Studies that are big, and there's a lot of data out there that actually children make you less happy. So there is this problem happening happening where we're like, okay, why are people less happy? But we mm. don't know. We don't but know I'm not what so it is. Sure. Again, and then you yeah. would expect then that the like, if you looked at the most unhappiest countries, you would expect Canada, the Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, because they're very egalitarian, and you're not seeing that they they actually have higher happiness levels. Well, than they have the highest here. rates of alcoholism in the world. You think of Denmark, Norway, Iceland in particular. But I, so I don't know I mean, how happy they are. Now you're changing. But if we're gonna just go by what makes people happy, I don't, I don't think happy, I don't like know if I. I think there are arguments to be made about like community and th those things may make people less happy. But this idea that's because women aren't having children, when we also have data, a lot of data that shows children, especially in the United States, has the biggest happiness gap. And then we're seeing that other countries that are more feminist are also not having like if you compare like Scandinavian countries to like the East, like I'm, my parents are immigrants from Iran. Iran has really high unhappiness levels. A lot of countries. Were, yeah, 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 exactly. So I don't know if you can say that this is causing that. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Nordic countries also have much more uh, homogeneity, which is correlated with uh, political agree. happiness. But so they're all, all um, of those differences. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the uh, the point about children making you unhappy and the point about leaving the cave, I think those are both a little bit of a cope because they're uh, belied by the fact that uh, if it were just that women were coming into their own now and they were recognizing the oppression of which they were not conscious previously then why would they keep getting less and less happy? You know, at a certain point, aren't you supposed to turn the corner and become more happy in your independence? But that's not what's happened. For 35 years, it just gets worse, worse, and worse, including relative mm -hmm. to men. And then for children, you, you look over the past, uh, what, 70 plus years now, 74 years, since 1950 to present day, the marriage rate has dropped by 60%, and the birth rate has dropped by 50%. So just looking at the whole society, we are having many, many fewer children than we were before. But and yet we're much less happy. Even even like sure, places whatever, like Pakistan are having less kids. Sure, I'm just I'm yeah. just pointing out you're saying that having fewer children makes you happier and I'm saying we're having many fewer children and Americans are much less happy. And you, you see this even beyond yeah. just but that's random not, surveys. You can't I kind link of that. I kind of want to push back on this idea that we've gotten um more unhappy as time has progressed because at least to my understanding what's happened in the last like, you know, twenty or thirty years is an increased awareness of like mental health and what that means. So it's not necessarily that people were really happy before and now suddenly are miserable. Yeah. It's just that now we're actually having data where people can talk openly about their mental health, unhappiness, and not be as stigmatized as before. Mm -hmm. If we look at the 1950s and even like housewives around that time, we see like there is actually like a huge rate of like narcotic usage and basically like prescriptions to that level. 
Um, so I'm not necessarily, if I would go as far to say, um, yeah, we've gotten unhappiness as time, we've gotten more unhappy as time has gone by. I would say more likely, oh no, we've been able to properly report, measure, and assess mental health as time has gone by. And sure. medicate. I mean, yeah. what, listen, I'm... Uh, very inclined towards your view that social scientific studies are bunk. I mean, there's a major replication prices. I think it's all ridiculous. I will cite those social science stats when they serve my argument, because uh, why not? That's what we do these days. But I agree. I'm, yeah, I'm skeptical of measuring happiness and all the rest of it. But on the mental health point, I think here we do have some pretty firm data, and it contradicts the argument you're making, which is uh, right now, one in five middle-aged women in the country is hooked on anti-depression drugs. On any given day, they're taking them. Women are two and a half times as likely as men to take these depression drugs. It is ubiquitous at this point. And, and the rates of taking depression drugs are going up. It's getting much worse. So if we're not getting uh, less and less happy, why do people keep taking more and more depression drugs? No, why were housewives in the 50s downing like a bottle of wine at lunch every day? I'm just saying yeah, now we're I seeing... I'm not so sure. I mean, these are anecdotes. We're supplanting that... self-medication now with actually like medically backed drugs that actually help women with their mental health issues. In I fact, don't know that It's also help. now that when you're sad, you just go to the doctor and they give you antidepressant drugs. I don't know how yeah. much more depressed people actually are other than the fact that they're just dishing them out to everybody. And they're dishing them out more and more and more. Sure, you can blame the pharmaceutical industry or the medical industry. I'm just pointing out, you know, one, one in order to argue against these social science s statistics, one has to just turn toward uh, unfalsifiable anecdotes and memes. You know, oh, the housewives were all miserable in the 50s. They were secretly, you know, drinking behind their husbands' backs. But I don't know, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I, all I have are the data available Well, the to data me, is and the just data saying that worse. more people are on antidepressants. It's not telling you why. It's not telling you what caused it. It's not telling you... Depression, so that's, presumably, that's, is causing well, it. Well, that's what we're debating here is what could have caused it. You're saying, oh, it's no, but I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, maybe they hate their husband, maybe they hate their kids, maybe they don't like, the, you know, the weather in their town. Like, I think but ADHD in any is case, a great example of this. Anyone now can just be like, oh, I have trouble focusing. Does yeah. everyone have ADHD or are people just getting these drugs? Like, you know, these are questions yeah. that we should ask before we jump to a conclusion. That no, I agree. Look, I think that they're pathologizing a, a lot of ordinary aspects of human nature. But I think part of the reason that we do that is because we're so radically misinterpreting human nature, which brings us right back to feminism.